Hello, good morning, and welcome to this Dawn Busters Taste Challenge. I wanted to start about 10 minutes ago. I'm a little late, unfortunately, but um, daylight is coming into play. Gonna go walking half a mile in a few minutes. We have from 1995 to 13, put in the barrel in 1995, bottled in 2013. The Glenn wrote this 43% single malt, Speyside single malt Scotch whiskey from Beer, Barry, I'm sorry, Barry Brothers and Rudd of London, England. They are wine and whiskey merchants, and this is produced at the Glen Livet Distillery. The Glen Rothes Distillery established 1879. There you go. Thank you, Robert, the Whiskey Scout, for giving me this great gift. I've never seen it. I had never to my knowledge, seen it in a store, but I could have seen it and just overlooked it. I wasn't actually looking for the Glen Rothes products. I kind of heard of it, but I really wasn't familiar with it. Now, this one is common, Matherns, Winn-Dixie, Walmart, everybody sells. The Glen Libet Founders Reserve established 1824. Well, yeah, the distillery, but actually this came out in 2015 this uh, line, uh, line extension. The Founders Reserve, no age statement. American Oak Selection. Selective use of first fill American Oak casts. Okay. Uh, I did buy this at Walmart and it's owned by Chivas Brothers. Chivas Brothers is Glenlivet, the Glenlivet is one of the Shivas Brothers brands. September 23rd, 2019, it was bottled September 23rd, 2019 at 643 Scotland time. All right, 40% alcohol. You would assume George J.G. Smith, George and J.G. Smith. You would assume that the 43% might give us a clue. But I tell you what, I had trouble yesterday. I got it right yesterday evening. I did get it correct. The Glen Rothes versus um, Glen Moray. But it was tough, and uh, I wasn't too confident after that. I was kind of shook a little bit. But I was able to calm my nerves because uh, first – First thing, it's not that important. It's just a whiskey taste challenge, not like some life or death, you know, super important thing. We get that. Okay. These whiskey, beer, and wine tastings and reviews are a hobby. They're fun to do, but some people approach it like it's a religion, you know. They're so volatile with it. A religion. It's not a religion. It shouldn't be. It's just something to do. It's a hobby. It's it's interest. It's an interest area. Um, and secondly, I was able to do the, Kona, we did the Kona hangout, any Kona beer and, um, went great. And the scores were higher than we had expected. So we, Kona surprised us, but everybody in the hangout is open-minded. You know, they, they don't have like an ax to grind with these companies. So that helps, you know, no agendas. When you get the agendas, then you're, Kind of run into trouble. Now, both of these use a real cork stopper, cap cover, bottle cover, um, stopper. Not the particle board cork pressed together, but real cork. Real cork. Now, the price disparity is pretty huge. Got it pretty even. Nice. Glen, the Glen Rothes is gold. And the Glenlivet is more like straw, straw, very light. This Founders Reserve was like $32 at Walmart. And the Glen Rothes is like a lot. Let's say $75, something like that. So But I was looking on Total Wine and I didn't even see it listed like nobody had it. So I, it was bottled eight years ago. So I don't know if you could still find the Glen Rothes 1995. Now, 
the whiskey scout found it because he went to a uh he goes to these liquor stores that are off the beaten path and they have and, and i go to those too and they have stuff so long ago from so long ago like if i go to international market they got rums that's 25 years old you could tell the, the label is so old uh and then he said the store went out of business anyway so it was like he got it he saw it he bought it got a great deal on it and uh he he gave me a bottle and it was a great gift jules gilpin Hello, Julie. Good morning to you. The Dixie Baseman says, good morning, Ron. I've had a lot of pleasant experiences with both brands, but I never had these particular ones, blends. I'm looking forward to your review. Well, yeah, these aren't blends. They're single malt, but I know what you're saying. All right. I have had the 12 year age Glen Livet, but I only tried it once at David's house. So I, I forget what it was like. I, I thought it was good. Just like the, uh, what's the rival of Glen Livet 12? It's the other thing with the G12, G12, something. Um, and uh, I never had Glen Rothis before to this bottle opening. Oh, I'm sure I'll be able to find it everywhere or most everywhere. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Total Wine and More and International Market and Savannah Discount, Discount Depot and Keith's and Star, all your big liquor outlets, uh, probably Broadway Liquor has it. Um, So the only single malt scotches I have so far opened is the Tomatin Dualcus Legacy, Dualcus, the Glenmore Standard Elgin Classics, that's two. The Glenlivet Founders Reserve, that's three. And then Glen Rothis 1995, that's four. I have the Glen Levitt 12 year, but I've not opened it yet. And it's the older bottle. I made sure I bought the older bottle. I saw them at Walmart. They had like two of the older bottles and then three of the new label with the, you know, with the colors. Each one got a different color, like the Caribbean got the orange, you know. But I said, no, let me get the old bottle. It's kind of neat to get the old stuff. So um, but that, that's gonna come back on the next go around. Morning, that looks good, says GR, GRN PSP. Thank you. All right, so I can't look because it's too easily seen that one is pale and one is gold, and uh, that'll tip me off. And that's what happened last yesterday afternoon, remember? And going into evening time, I looked down, I said, Oh, I had to start over. <sighs> this is very mild distilled grain. You say, oh no, it's not a grain whiskey, it's a malt whiskey, single malt. Yeah, but what is malt made from in this case? Because you can make wheat malt. Barley malt, and what is barley? You say, uh, a grain, right. It's not column still grain whiskey. They have Scottish distilleries that make only grain alcohol. They take in mainly corn, column still in it, like they do at uh, Midwest Grain Products, and then they'll use it for blending, you know? Or in some cases, single grain whiskey, like what is it, Hay Club? They're taking single grain, they're doing a different approach, grain whiskey. No malted barley. But these are all malted barley, you get it, you dig, okay. Could you do that in America? Could you, in the United States of America, could you make single malt, single barley malt whiskey? Of course you could do it. You it wouldn't be bourbon because bourbon has to be what kind of grain? Remember, what kind of grain? Anyone, anyone? <laughs> See, bourbon is a specific type of grain. Single malt whiskey from Scotland is a single, is a specific type of grain, namely barley malt. 
You can make wheat whiskey. That's a grain. Corn whiskey. That's a grain. Uh, rice is a grain. You could make whiskey with rice and so on. You see, so. This one in my nose. Hmm. Seems milder. This one seems stronger. Now, this one seems to have more of a barley, grain, alcohol thing. You say, what about the peat? What about the smoke? Well, you can just write that off. That ain't going to happen here. You'll get more. You'll get more smoke and peat. In Hunter Piper's blended scotch, which is probably only 20 percent single malt whiskey. But it might be a lot of Isla because it, 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 um, it's pretty pronounced in the smokiness. But these, no, you could forget it. Because they're not designed for that. These are space out, which would be very mild. Okay, uh, Glenn Morangy is one of their competitors, if I recall properly. Bourbon is 51% corn. You got it, the Dixie Base, man. 51% or higher. Could be 100% if you'd like. Glenn Morin Morangy, yeah. The orange bottle. Yellowish orange, the 10 year age, their base model. I reviewed that one. That's the one where I dropped the bottle. It kind of slipped out my hand a little bit, and the bottle neck <laughs> crashed into the uh, Glencairn glass. And that was the first break. First time I broke one. Then we had a second time, third, fourth, and then that was the end of uh, the Glen Glencairn glasses. Nice glasses. Uh, supposedly, they. Uh, push all the uh, vapors towards your nose and whatnot, but they are flimsy as heck. Those things break with no excuse. Now you say you got to be careful. That's true, but when you're doing it, the volume of work, <laughs> you want to use that word lightly, work, quote unquote, they're going to break because you're going to, you know, tap You'll tap the glass a little bit, like I could do with these. You just go tap, no big deal. But the Glen Cairn is going to shatter. So thin. They have their place, but their place is not here at this house, I don't believe, because they just can't handle the, the stressors I put on them. But I do thank John and Ely for the gift of the four glasses. I wish they would have lasted two years. Um, these Diamores are a lot more tough, a lot tougher glass. I know technically, if you want to get techno, they may not be proper for this, but uh, they're proper for me because they're resilient and I don't have to be constantly consumed with worry about, oh, I'm going to break the glass. And that's what I, that's basically what the Glen Cairn, what I was thinking about all, all the time. Don't break it, don't break it. It's like a, it's like I can't concentrate on the whiskey. What's the calling card on these two? Mildness. Now, somebody might say, you mean bland and dull. They're bland. I don't like to really use those terms because Sometimes you'd be putting the product down for what it's designed to be. It would be like drinking Rolling Rock and saying, it's so bland, it's so bland. Well, you have to understand what they're trying to do with Rolling Rock. It's an extra pale lager. That's their whole, what is their big thing? Extra pale. That's what they say. So really what it's trying to do is be an extra mild lager, low alcohol, you know, low average, 4.4%. In England, that would be just average, but low average alcohol level, mild aroma, mild flavor, very pale appearance, crisp body. And that's what it's supposed to be. Now, I think they improved it since the buyout in 2006 because it used to also have another attribute, which was to me, chalky undertaste and body. I, I didn't like that. 
But once they got bought out and Anheuser Bush started producing it, that disappeared. So to me, they probably noticed that too. It's like, what's wrong with this stuff? And they, so is, and they got rid of it. So is Rolling Rock an optimum product for me? It isn't really optimum because I rather more body, more flavor, more character and all that. Same thing with Scotch whiskey. I would rather more robust, smoky, iodine, you know, compost peatiness, you know, more intense character, bold, more roof, rooflessness, more rooflessness. But everybody don't like that. You see, everybody doesn't appreciate those or even want to entertain those characteristics. But they would like a mild, mellow, blend, uh, single malt scotch. These would fit the bill. Some people like a mild, mellow lager. Rolling Rock would fit the bill. Burley Sullivan says, you. Now, so I think there's too much in the beer, wine, and liquor reviewing world. There's too many, like, hardened positions that people take, like dedicated. If you want to become, like, a start taking a Sigmund Freudian approach, you could say maybe they have too many fixations on characters. Like IPA must be this. And then you run with whatever attribute you're fixated upon. A fixation is like where you have this constant, it's like an obsession, you know, in your mind. So, uh, or it could be a fixation on an ABV. So then you, then you like limit your thinking to, uh, you can only like, you'll say the beer must be this way, that way, this, and it can, and then, you, so if anything is divergent from that, oh no, it's a, you just start talking bad about the product and it's terrible. And you say, well, isn't that the case in politics that people have these fixations? It is the case. Or if you study in history or government or whatever, law, legal, study in legality or whatever, that people have these fixations, so then they can't they can't think of things in a hypothetical manner. You understand? Meaning, you look at things both ways, and you consider possibilities, and then you break it down from there. So when you talk to people with these fixations, it's very difficult to talk to them because that leads to their they have a very uh, like I say, hardened position, and then they tend to be very volatile and uh, wound up. And so then, well, you know the result, they fly off the handle. I got a woman on Facebook, I don't know this lady from Jack Spratt. If I saw her, I wouldn't know who she was. She was uh, one of these constant commenters on a, on a friend of mine, my friend's sister, really. She's not a friend of mine, but I've been knowing her since 1986. You know what I'm saying, 85. So, uh, and she's all, all day long on Facebook with every kind of thing. She was one of the people that told me, you ought to get on Facebook. This is like in 2009. I said, I don't want to get on something where a bunch of women are talking. Uh, Cause to me, that's what it was. Just a bunch of women talking all day. She said, no, we have fun. You know, and I said, I don't know. Then, then my, uh, my mother's first cousin, he's my first cousin once removed on the upper end. He was telling me, get on there because uh, you can communicate with your family and stuff. I said, okay, but I didn't want to really be bothered with it so much, but uh, yeah, I liked it for the most part. But this lady, I'll give you an example. This is what I'm talking about, fixations and, and volatility. She was talking about Drew Brees, of all people, a quarterback in the NFL who retired last uh, this year after playing last year. And uh, he had made some impertinent statements, which were kind of like garbled. I thought to myself, does he need me as his spokesman? Because he doesn't. apparently think about things or whatever ramifications or 
I don't know. So I, they were, go, oh, we're going to defend you, Drew. We're going to defend you. I said, how do you defend that? You know, because um, I can show you he's wrong in this sense. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, no. She just went crazy, you know. How dare you criticize like he was a god, like like he was her idol. I said, well, of course, because he's wrong. And I can show you how he's wrong. That's my opinion, of course. Oh, no, no, no. She was just like this was her husband, you see. I said, well, you know, but I think he's wrong. And then next thing she blocked me. I said, well, that's that's a clear indication that you, A, don't know what you're talking about, and B, you can't defend your position. And I told this woman who i am been knowing since 1985, I said, your friend is wrong. She's weak. And she said, well, I have a lot of people block me on Facebook and all that. That, that wasn't a, uh, that actually wasn't the topic that I was discussing at the time. I was talking about this one particular person. So um, I do take issue with people that's they like to set fires, but they can't handle heat. You know what I'm saying? They go around on Internet and they set fires. And they they the, the hottest one to talk. And I say, oh, look at this. Here's somebody who wants to get right down to it, don't, don't you? But if you disagree with them in any way and at any point, they go on a block. I say, well, you're you're a psychopath in a way. It's like you have a psychopathic. I'm not saying a person is like literally a psychopath, you know, what I'm saying? but they have a psychopathic mindset. Of like in the Bible, they talk about, you know. This kind of thinking, you know. Of the self elevated, like I am the emperor of Babylon and I am a virgin and I can I am I have no rivals. I cannot be topped at, at any point. I love me some me like the old NFL player said, I love me some me. But the Persians still breached your walls and you were destroyed. You were destroyed. You might say it's a self idolatry. It is like a self idolatry. This one has a little bit of peatiness, and I have to concede to that. I have to concede that. But it's not pronounced in any way. But there is a little bit. There's a little bit. There is a little bit. We'll go, we'll, we'll, we'll admit that. But you'd have to talk about philosophical and viewpoints of discourse before you'd ever reach it. You'd have to figure it out, you know. In other words, you'd have to rest on it, like I've been doing and sipping on until you till you you say, Oh, there it is. Okay, let's look at the comments. I think I'm about to call this. Hey Burley, says Jules. The Dixie bass man says rock and roll. Oh, rock and roll. I, I thought she was about to say rock and roll ain't noise pollution. Okay. Rolling rock is a bit overkill comparison, in my opinion. I don't think it is. But uh, Chalky Aftertaste is fairly accurate for their pre-2006 offerings. I always noticed that. I started buying Rolling Rock in 1997. And the only reason I bought it is because I wanted to get the bottle and can collection going, you know, bottles and cans. Well, I didn't know they were going to sell out. How would I know? But the family sold the company in 2006. Uh, for whatever reason, I didn't get into their business. Furthermore, I didn't really care what they did. So, um, and then when Anheuser-Busch bought it, they altered the label a little bit. And well, uh, I said, well, let me buy it. I said, I don't even like this stuff. I said, but I'll choke it down for the six pack. I never could get singles for my collection. But then I noticed, I said, whoa, the chalkiness is gone. I said, kudos to you, Anheuser-Busch, for getting rid of that nasty little element. Now, other people have told me, oh, didn't they ruin it? Don't you think they ruined it? I said, I don't know. If you like chalk, I guess they ruined it. It's that way in the musical world as well, says the Dixie Bass Man. If you enjoy or perform a particular singer's music, you must agree with everything they do, did, or live in a similar way. Oh, boy, you're right about that. I mean, you are so right. Okay, here's a good example. I got Stevie Nicks' album, uh, 
what's that one from 1981? The first one she did. It's not called Stevie Nicks, it's called Stevie Nicks. You know what I'm talking about with all the famous songs on it. Great album. She made all the other members of the band jealous because the album was a big hit. And they were like, you're going to quit. You're going to quit. You're making us all paranoid. She's no, I'm not paranoid. I'm not making y'all paranoid. Y'all are making me paranoid because it's like I did a solo album and everybody's flipping out, you know. Uh, but anyway, whatever the name of the album is, I can't remember for some reason. I like it. OK, I listen to it. I like her work, her work in Fleetwood Mac for the most part. And I like a lot of her other solo efforts. But I mean, she posts, posts to me the most ridiculous things on Facebook, all her political stuff. I say, what a person to uh, like everything is about politics. It doesn't make any difference to me. I don't care if she posts about Barack Obama 50 times a day. I don't care. But I got some people I know that say, I'm never listening to her albums again because she uh, said something good about Joe Biden. I say, well, I said, I didn't buy that album because I thought she was uh, in, in line with my political ideology. I said, I assume she wasn't. After all, she'd been living in Hollywood forever. I said, well, um, I assume we weren't in, in, uh, alliant, in, you know, in line with our political thinking. I don't buy people's rock albums because I share their ideology. Okay, I don't care about their ideology in a, in a general, in a for the most part. So, um, but you got people that just fly; they go crazy. You know about that? Same thing with beer. People are like, why are you drinking Founders beer? Don't you know they're a racist company? <laughs> you know that kind of, and that's a real. You have to really entertain levels of idiot idiocy to go 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 into that playground. But there's people that they. What I'm saying is people actually think that way. <laughs> so you have to kind of work around it if you, if it's possible. You say, well, it's cancel culture and all that. I know I've been dealing with that for years, not three or four years, but I'm talking about going on 10 years. With people that are um, you could say simple minded. <laughs> I guess that's the term. They think they're smart, but they clearly aren't. Okay, um, but they don't realize it. <laughs> you know how? Anyway, I'm not. You say, well, wh what makes you a genius? I don't know. Whoever said I was one? I never made any claim to that effect. I just noticed that other people are not. Most definitely not a genius. But boy, they love to host their own poster contest. All right. Anyway. Man, I tell you what, this stuff here is is a is a real rip because on the surface or or prima facie, you know what I'm saying? Like you would say, oh well, the the Glenn the Glenn Rothis 1995 is going to be the clear and it's going to be the easy winner. I mean, there's not going to be any kind of contest. It's going to be kind of a farce. This is a farce but it isn't. That's the scary thing. If you ever want to see a whiskey that gets ripped and attacked, it's the Glen Livid Founders Reserve. I mean, I've seen people that have like virtual nervous breakdowns, question their whole life, give up, give up on life to a large extent because of the Glen Livid Founders Reserve. I mean, go crazy. I watched these videos. I was like, wow. You don't know. These are people that clearly have never tried a bad whiskey. I could I could steer them in that direction, however. Going crazy. And I said, oh, no, no, this is not a real review. You got some kind of axe to grind here. But, you know, I made comments. Very nice comments. You all know I make nice comments, but I never heard back, of course. Um, and then we got the Glen Rothis where people would sell their own children into slavery to get a bottle of it, apparently. And uh, is it really winning and beating all these uh, competitors? You've watched the videos, maybe. I'm making the videos. I'm not seeing it. 
you say, well, you're a fool, you're a moron, you're, you're a fascist, neo-crypto, Marxist, communist, invisible man, chemist. Any, any drunk off the street could tell you that the, it was bottled in 19, it was barreled in 1995 and aged for 18 years, you moron. It's 43% alcohol. You know, even the shooters don't know who killed. Man, all I wanted to do was be a priest. Look, Camelot and Smithereens. That's what this is because I cannot really find that it's that demonstratively better. And I'm sorry. If I thought it was standing out, if I thought the Glenn Rothis 1995 was standing out and racing ahead of these, like a, a Baffert horse that's on. No, I, I mean, I would say it, but I'm not saying that. So I'm not gonna say it. And that might ruffle some feathers and hurt some feelings. And I'm sorry, I'm not here. I just gotta call it as I see it. And I'm not seeing, I am not seeing where it is running ahead of the pack. Is it a bad product? Bad, are you crazy? It's great, but. This other one is pretty great too, in my amateur opinion, because that's where people are gonna call me out. Where's your certificate? Well, you see that wallet in the drawer over there with the, the money in it? That's my certificate. Okay, I bought I bought the products. Well, I didn't buy this when it was a gift, but you know what I'm saying? I'm buying the products, that's my certificate. And like my friend David says, I bought it, I'll say whatever I want to say about the beer. I said, that's a good approach even if it makes me angry, which would never make me angry. Never in my life have I ever gotten angry about somebody's opinion about a beer or wine or liquor. I can assure you that. I was perplexed, like when people said Budweiser tastes like horse urine drained through a dirty sock. I thought, A, I've never drunk that. And secondly, you're being very melodramatic and you're trying to get views, comments, likes, and subscribes and get people to buy your t-shirt. Because <laughs> Ain't no way you're going to tell me Budweiser is that bad. You might tell me it's ordinary. Okay, I'll, I'll buy into that. But all these histrionics that people put behind Budweiser, uh-uh. This cat ain't feeding into it. Okay, I'm going to say, well, honestly, I really can't tell the difference. I don't find that there's a great divergence between these two. And that could sound bad. That might sound, you might say, well, I'm embarrassed watching this. You're making me embarrassed. Okay, I'm sorry, but I'm I'm not seeing that great of a disparity. But for technical purposes, I'm going to say this is the Glenn Rothis. And, but if I get it right, it's a meaningless thing. It's meaningless because it's basically a coin flip. It's like, well, you flipped a coin. You called heads and you got heads. Look how good you are at flipping coins. Right. Let's do it 50 times. 25 times I got heads. 25 times I got tail. I'm really good at this. Okay. So that's the probability we're dealing with. Ah, uh, it's the Glenn Livet 12. Well, there you go. Uh, woo. Well, we could say that basically my understanding of the Glenn Rothis 1995 is bad or something. I'm missing something. There's some something somewhere that I'm not latching on to. There's some, you know what I mean? You say, no, there's a clearly defined character that everyone catches up. You know, a child can figure this out. Well, I'm apparently not even at, to the level of a child because I'm not getting it. And, you know, you say that's so that's so low grade. That is like the bottom of the single malt scotch. Well, I don't care if it's at the bottom. I don't care if it's below the bottom. I'm not seeing any great divergence and I couldn't even get it right. So do I have a lot of work to do on the Glenn Rothis? Yeah, a whole lot of work. <laughs> Somebody just saved Dallas DA a ton of work. And I'm happy about that. And uh, you say that's the best kind of work, ain't it? Yeah, sure is. All right. So that's it. Uh, can't get it right. But. It's the way it goes, like my daddy says, way it goes heading west. All right, cluck, 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 says Julie Gulpin. Rooster, 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 and a, and a smiley face, right. Joe Biden's dentist says, society could use a healthy dose of stoicism. No, they'd be too busy blocking people to be stoic. 
You say, uh, separating the art from the artist. Right. I don't care if Genghis Khan brewed the beer. If it's good, I'll buy it. That's the way I look at it. But um, some people just can't separate. They can't, uh, what's the word, compartmentalize. And, um, and I don't care. Horse urine through a sock. If they aren't exaggerating, someone has a very strange kink. And I have a great deal of pity for whoever is monitoring their internet history. You're right. Because I watch videos. Those you, you ever get if you ever get bored at your house, you don't know what to do for fun. Just get on uh, YouTube and type in Budweiser review and just go back for years. And you will see the most outrageous and outlandish reviews. And uh, if you want to use the word review in history. I mean, this this stuff is a joke. These are people who obviously are desperate for attention. Uh, they're trying to fill a hole or, or something. I mean, it's. I, I want to tell these people, come on, man. You, you cannot be serious. There's no way you are serious at this point. Because you might be fooling a lot of dum dums, and you ain't fooling me. Because this is this is ridiculous. Back and to the left, right. That's right. Um, you crazier than your mama. I said good day, sir. <laughs> 